this presentation, I will start with a short introduction to also explain the context in which open hardware has its place within CERN. I will continue with the motivation for open hardware to arrive to the initiatives that were launched at CERN and finish with some conclusions. Uh, let me start a bit with the context. So the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is the biggest machine ever built. Its aim is to study the finest constituents of matter and the forces between them. The main scientific challenge is to understand those processes that took place at uh, the very first moments after the Big Bang. And in order to understand these processes, and the closer we want to arrive to these processes, the higher the energies we need to achieve. So the idea of the LHC is to take particles, bring them to those very high energies, make them collide, and study what uh, comes out of the collisions. And the LHC, apart from the biggest machine ever built, it's also the most complex one. It took more than 10 years, 10,000 people coming from more than 100 different countries, and more than $9 billion for it to be built. And it, actu it actually consists of um, a series of uh, smaller accelerators that are gradually increasing uh, the energies of the particles. It all starts from a bottle of hydrogen, from where we remove the electrons to get the protons beam. Then the protons receive a uh, first acceleration at uh, the booster. Uh, from the booster, they enter to PS, a uh, machine built in the um, uh, 60s. From the PS, they arrive to SPS, and uh, where they increase even more their energies. And finally, they uh, enter the LHC. Half of the particles of the SPS enter the LHC on one direction, and the other half on the opposite direction. In the 27 kilometers of the LHC, the particles arrive to their nominal energies. And finally, they collide. And it's exactly then and there where the big moments for the uh, physicists at CERN begin. Now, the team um, we are all working for is called beam controls. And our mandate is to actually uh, control the beam uh, particles throughout their journey in and uh, out of uh, these accelerators. So for example, we need uh, to provide electronic solutions that um, uh, ensure that uh, the particles come out of uh, one machine and into the next one on very precise moments. And at the same time, we have uh, to uh, provide um, electronics that uh, monitor different parameters of the beam, like the stability or the width of the beam. Uh, here are some pictures of uh, these electronics. Uh, there are many different designs, they're quite complex, and they have to remain robust and reliable for the 10 to 15 years of operation of the LHC. Now, the design process of, uh, of a typical board uh, includes the selection of different components or IP cores, and the selection of different tools. And uh, so far, most of these components and tools have been provided to us by, by classic companies. And we have seen that throughout the years, this uh, have led us to some difficult dependencies. So for example, uh, some of the components or tools have become obsolete. So when companies are not happy with their turnover, they may decide to uh, uh, stop the support. Uh, uh, other times, uh, they become uh, much more expensive. And it has also happened that we come across some unexplained bugs. And in all these situations, we have to come up with alternatives. And many times, this has not been easy. And we have seen that it has costed us a lot in terms of time and money. So it's in a context like this when open hardware enters. And it comes with the idea of making everything we design freely and openly available for it to be studied, modified, distributed, made, and sold. Open hardware is, of course, um, inspired by the free and open source uh, software principles, and it tries to apply them into hardware. Now, uh, the, um, the whole idea is based on the belief that there is a creative abundance in uh, the world. There is um, a lot of uh, creative and skillful people. And on top of that, there is a lot of similar needs on different projects. So for example, on our domain, the particle accelerators, there are more than a thousand accelerators all over the world. And uh, many of them are uh, having uh, uh, facing similar problems. So we could avoid doing um, unnecessary effort if someone has already designed uh, what we need. We could instead build upon it and uh, get better or uh, different designs. 
And the way to arrive to that is by making everything we design open for study, modification, distribution, or uh, uh, sale. With the freedom to study and modify a design, we can tackle obsolescence and we can also uh, debug uh, the designs as uh, the source code is available. And finally, since different companies can provide the, the same products, uh, we can release ourselves from uh, monopoly dependencies. Now, in the day-to-day -day life, open hardware includes a lot of design reuse. Very critical for this is being uh, based on very well-established standards, and this we ensure the interoperability between different modules. Uh, uh, peer review, uh, there's a lot of peer review, and once you go open, the chances are that the people will be interested in what you're doing, so you will get their feedback and their critic, and you would have a different pairs of eyes looking at your design through different angles. Uh, Linus Law here says that given enough eyeballs uh, or bugs are shallow. Open hardware also helps you become a better designer yourself. Uh, you're forced to uh, write cleaner code and to document better the designs, so you become better. And it's also a great uh, learning tool as it offers um, uh, a wealth of well-documented uh, clean and open projects. Now, let me continue with a more financial uh, aspect of uh, open hardware and where the companies uh, fit into uh, the picture. Uh, so, uh, hardware uh, companies, uh, similarly to the software ones, uh, can um, profit uh, by providing, uh, can make profit by providing support. Red Hat and Ubuntu in the software world are, are um, big and good examples of that. But now, a uh, big difference between software and hardware is the fact that in hardware, someone has to actually manufacture, has to produce uh, the designs. So on the hardware world, companies can uh, make a profit upon uh, manufacturing or uh, testing or a warranty uh, on their products. Uh, SparkFun and the Arduino are some examples. And now in our case, we have seen that uh, with open hardware, we have managed to have healthy relations with uh, companies. Now we can select a company according to the added value it provides, rather than the fact that it's the only one that, that uh, provides what we need. <coughs> and now let me uh, clarify a bit uh, the differences between uh, open proprietary, commercial and non-commercial. So commercial and proprietary leads to vendor lock-in situations. And that's similar to what you may have experienced with, uh, with like uh, capsules of coffee machines or um, cables that are incompatible. Uh, open and non-commercial brings uh, the whole uh, support burden to the developers, and we have seen that that leads to non-sustainable solutions. But commercial and open is, uh, we believe that is the best combination of both worlds. It gives high quality products and good support. And non-commercial and proprietary is just dedicated and not reusable projects. And let me now continue with the uh, open hardware initiatives uh, within CERN. So we copied the software world, and we knew that we had to follow three different axes. We first needed uh, a website that would house the the, all the designs, similarly to GitHub uh, for software. We needed a license that would provide the legal frame, uh, similarly to the GPL or the Creative Commons. And we needed tools uh, like uh, the VI and the GCC on the, hard on the software world. The website is the open hardware repository.org. It publishes everything uh, needed to review, modify, and manufacture a design. It offers um, fully open access, so there's no need for an account. And itself, it's built upon a free and open source software. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of the projects. You may see in the different tabs uh, here. Uh, there are the wikis that explain the project, the activity, issues that are continuously being tracked, uh, news, the documentation, and uh, the repository with all the source files. Today, uh, there are 120 active projects, uh, 70 initiated at CERN and 50 outside. Uh, there are 65 uh, hardware designs and 55 IP blocks. We are 165 active developers coming from 12 companies and uh, 10 research centers. Regarding the license now, 
the lawyers at the CERN Knowledge and Technology Transfer Group, after a relevant study, they decided that there was indeed the need of creating a new license as none of the existing ones were uh, explicitly mentioning something about manufacturing goods. So the CERN Open Hardware uh, License states uh, the conditions for using and modifying a design. It's a persistent license, uh, so any modification or distribution has to happen under the same license. And like this, we ensure that everybody um, profits from modifications or uh, improvements. Uh, it is clear and easy to read. It's only a couple of pages long. And we have seen that it has made it easier uh, for us to work with uh, the others, especially big companies with, uh, with big legal departments. And there are many different products that they have been published under the CERN Open Hardware License, outside CERN and many completely outside the electronics world. There is a worms farm, a balloon mapping kit, an electrocardiogram. <coughs> And now I will continue with the tools. Now the tools is the last hurdle to sharing as uh, they're um, currently mainly dominated by proprietary solutions. Uh, now in comparison to software where just VI and the GCC are enough uh, for um, developing hardware, the situation is a bit more complex. So regarding gateway, so what goes inside an FPGA, uh, there's the need of an HDL simulator and regarding uh, the design of an electronics board, the steps are schematic entry, PCB layout, uh, the artwork, drilling, and the instructions to the pick and place uh, machine. And currently all these steps are uh, done by proprietary software. However, there are uh, currently efforts uh, for free and open source software. So there is Icarus Verilog for the simulation and there is the KiCad software suite uh, for uh, the PCB design, and uh, Tom and Orson will give you an overview of KiCad. And now let me finish with um, a, a, s a short example uh, that would put maybe the different bits and pieces together. I will use the White Rabbit case. Uh, White Rabbit is one of the biggest projects currently in uh, the open hardware repository. So it started by the needs of CERN to renovate one of the biggest and most critical um, uh, systems of the accelerator. It's the timing system. Uh, and the timing system is responsible for uh, providing a common notion of time to equipment installed in all, all the different areas in the ma different machines. And from the beginning, it was decided to base it on uh, well-established standards like Ethernet. So it uh, went open and it soon attracted um, similar institutes that were having um, similar needs. And uh, it has been really exciting moments for the White Rabbit team receiving these emails from really unlikely places like uh, an experiment in Siberia and another one in uh, Tibet. And companies uh, were also uh, interested, big ones like national instruments and other <coughs> smaller ones. And the different players would build upon the initial ideas, so they would evolve the designs according to their needs and create uh, different products. Peer reviewing also worked well, with bugs uh, being spotted by uh, the different players. And today, White Rabbit technology is available by several different companies, and one can decide uh, the company to choose according to uh, pricing or the support it provides. And there are also ongoing efforts for the standardization of the White Rabbit technology uh, within the IEEE, as it's the next uh, new big thing in the field of uh, synchronization. <coughs> so to conclude, uh, open hardware uh, brings uh, for companies negligible upfront costs and an easy entry into the market and uh, companies can uh, make profit upon manufacturing, uh, uh, warranty or the support of uh, technology. And now regarding institutes, we have seen that open hardware uh, brings us to better designs. Uh, we can avoid vendor lock-in and uh, we really enjoy building hardware in collaboration with people from all over the world. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. yeah, questions, I guess, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess first question.
Or, or I don't know how you want to do it. Yeah. Maybe a short question? No? Yeah. Um, you have one. Okay. Uh, it's, it's IP block. What is IP block? I know it's not property. Like it's um, firmware. It's, it's not a component itself. It's something mm -hmm. that can go inside the component. Okay. Okay. I like the um, in control like um, some smaller cards which which you plug onto. Uh, no, it's so actually what what would go inside uh, inside an FPGA. Mm -hmm. It can be an IP. Okay. okay. So it's a VHA code. Yes. Uh, yes. For, for us. I don't think there's a really good reason to call it IP. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And some of our some of our friends don't like intellectual property. Uh, so don't like the term, mm -hmm. and they, they like to use something like intellectual monopoly, which is what it really is. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> yeah. Are there any ways in which um, people like us can get into the FPGA world for this? Yes. Do you mean in terms of development? Uh, yeah. would like to develop? have, OK, we're in hackerspace. We have essentially no money. Yes. Now, uh, are there any ways in which we can play with it? Get into FPGAs or start there are cheap start boards. playing with this. There are cheap boards. Yeah, but design tools? Because I saw a signal yes. later. for free? Right, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Xilinx, for example, <coughs> there is something called Xilinx Webpack. And it doesn't cover all the chips of Xilinx, but if you want to target the um, lowest grade chips uh, in each family. Probably the only ones we can afford. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 true. that's free as in free beer. Uh, that, that tool is free as in free beer. Uh, the synthesis tool. Regarding simulation, Icarus is already very good in very low. If you use the very low language, Icarus is already perfectly good. We are contributing to giving BACL and system very low support to Icarus because many oftentimes you have you're picking cores from opencores.org or, or other people who do parts of the design, and these cores might come in different languages. And and one you know if you only do very low, Icarus very low will simulate everything for you. But there's not a very good, there's not at all a mixed language simulator which is free. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to have VHL support takers because VHL is very popular in Europe and um, very low is a bit more popular in, in the States and Asia. So uh, that's, you know, ma many, many times you end up with a mixed language uh, design. Mm -hmm. And if you want to simulate that before targeting your chip, you need a simulator. And very log, uh, Icarus Verilog is, in our opinion, the most promising free one. That's what we're help, well, helping develop it. And, and once you have simulated it, you go to the synthesis, and that's the silence tool, in the case of silence. I think the Altera one is also free, right? Yeah, yes. 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 even It's even more free than that. So it's a... Uh, <laughs> <I'm, yeah. laughs> and there are cheap boards that you can buy, and some of them are open source hardware. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes. I have a question. What's the most popular? What's the most popular IP for the last? For the, use of a better word. Um, what's the most popular IP that's been released under uh, Open Hardware Project by CERN? Not by the other ones, because I saw I saw the slide with the the list of about eight companies that had stuff like uh, automatic watering system and stuff like that. That's kind of cool. But I'm curious to know: Did CERN um, release anything that would be interesting to us? Uh -huh. I mean. There's, there's some pretty sophisticated hardware, but we're not going to be setting up a beam line here. Well, we could be. Why? 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 Yeah, people, upstairs yeah, would object to that. people upstairs would object to having an uh, accelerator here. <laughs> What's the most popular project you the guys have done for the moment? Yeah. Uh, there is, um, there's a little microcontroller project by you, but okay, that was a long time ago. Yeah, that's uh, a bit unsupported. <laughs> uh, yes, but in terms of software, I think the, the one that they are going to be introducing, that can be pretty interesting for many people. What is this? A uh, KiCad. So yeah, okay. uh, we're going to take KiCad and we use Altium, right, at work. Altium is a proprietary tool which is very complete and allows us to design PCBs. Uh, mm -hmm. We would like to take KiCad to a level of features and quality. KiCad is a free tool. It's not. It's, it's a bit... It takes a hit on your productivity for, for complex boards. Yeah, so Today you can already use it for simple boards. Yeah, but it's a bit crunchy. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> to say. So we are really committed to making KiCad better. And uh, Orson, here, is so working full time on KiCad development. Okay, we like so, you. <laughs> uh, so he's a C++ developer, 
Uh, so basically, for us, the most useful stuff that's going to come out of CERN is KiCad. I would say that would be very useful if you want to do electronics design. Yes. Good. Well, that's already good. Yeah, that's, yes. yes. That's us. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, because then sharing would be seamless. Today, the problem with sharing PCB designs is that if I do it in Altium and, and you don't have an Altium license, you can't even see it. And if you have, by some chance, another, you know, the, the market for PCB design tools is fragmented. It's not even like in office suites where you have a proprietary vendor which is dominating the market. So even if it's proprietary, if you write a document in Word, you are pretty sure that everybody will be able to open it because there's so many people that who have access to this. In, in, in PCB design tools, uh, it's worse because it's not only proprietary, that, that it's fragmented. You have like four or five big players which each of them has 20% uh, of the market. So there are many chances that you do a design and then you want to share it. You, 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 set, you put your design files online mm -hmm. and then whoever you want to share it with uh, doesn't have the ability to open it. Also the um, learning curves uh, of these tools are pretty um, steep. Mm -hmm. So if we had, um, you know, we want to do with KiCad what, what GCC did to software, right? Yeah. Democratize access and, and uh, make it very, very easy to share and make it very easy to go from a source to something useful. Um, so that's missing. That's a very important missing component in the um, hardware world as, 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 long as, as sharing goes. Sharing is, has this hurdle you know, that we need to, um, uh, to overcome. So I think the most important thing we're doing for the general public now would be the key I support. think it's key yes. the, so, But as far as actual hardware is concerned, that as far as actual hardware that CERN has designed as supporting, yes. none of this really, I mean, it's really esoteric stuff, honestly. It's <laughs> controls and data acquisition mostly. Yes. At really high speeds, don't worry. Uh, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. We have anything, a, anything that we, we would be interested in? Uh, I don't know what you're interested in, but <laughs> well, for um, example, I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind measuring temperature over every square meter in this room. That basically uh -huh. means, uh, well, not just this room, the whole the whole lab. Yes. I would like I would like to know what temperature is all over the place because I'm brewing beer. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I would like to know this as cheap as possible. So no, obviously, think, that means do that installing one meter. wire sensors all over the place. Yeah. And well, no, that's not enough. the type of stuff we do. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of what, what I'm sort of interested yes, in. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, but maybe some other designs under OHL, right? There's, there's so much. Yes, there's VHL stuff we put online, like for example, if you want to interface to PCI Express or something like that. Or, I mean, at some point you're going to want to send this data to a computer. And, Okay, but yeah. interfacing what to PCI Express? Probably some exotic uh, hardware bus. The rest of your VHDL in a chip. So, uh, yeah, it will be in an FPGA setting. So, yeah, it is um, a bit on the high end ish. Uh, yeah. For now, is he the only one working on KiCad? Or is it, I mean, I mean supporting. He's, you said He's one very one. good. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. But you said 100. I, I, get, I get the impression it's him 100%. Yes. Is there anything, anybody else beside him? Uh, he's yes. helping. Okay, good. And, okay, and the, um, the thing is, this for KiCad has been a revolution because I don't think KiCad, which is the most promising free tool for PCB design in the world, yeah. I, just to, to give you a, a sense of the difference between proprietary and, and free, the free worlds, right? Yeah. The proprietary tools, they, they enjoy teams of 20, 30, whatever. Um, I don't think KiCad had ever enjoyed a full, a full person, full time on it. For such a long time, and, and now they're up to one and a half people. Uh, no, not yeah, they have time. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. He's one half. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Stuff to explain. Hopefully, the upper half. Let's say five percent of these guys like half of it. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Decades uh, ago, I used to work for a PCB. That's quite um, terrific. Back in CAD company, and they had three developers, and it was absolutely fine to do. Mm -hmm. The schematic capture, the you know, PCB layout, the Gerber output, the auto routing, everything mm -hmm. with those three people. Which which so smart. You're talking about? So we'll, we'll trust you that you're smart. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, uh, which company are we talking about? Um, this was okay. the company that makes the Ranger product, which is you probably never heard of it. It's a UK one, mm -hmm. one of the small okay. ones. But it was pretty. I mean, I used it professionally, and it was rock solid. Oh, by the way, if you know any good C++ Press. developer who would like who would like to lend a hand, it would be uh, we would be able to um, to coach him and uh, her <laughs> and uh, to give work packages and so we're really looking for more collaborators as well. Would you be able to pay them? 
Um, we're, we have a donations site open. So far, we have just gotten one donation uh, from a very illustrious player from Arduino, from the Arduino people. Um, we also had a proposal to be paid in bitcoins. <laughs> you, should, you should have said yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was not Four from months ago. I think, yeah. <laughs> And it was not from an anonymous, I will tell you afterwards <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, quite interesting. Um, but, yes, I definitely don't believe in unpaid work. And I think my colleagues feel the same way. There is uh, definitely this confusion all the time about free as in free beer, free as in freedom. Um, it, it would really be cool if we could pay everybody who does useful work. And um, in the case of KiCad, uh, we have already spent this donation uh, on the main developers of Kika, yeah. who deserved it. And um, also is paid, you know. <laughs> uh, but I don't think we have today the ability to, uh, to pay more people. So yeah. can, you, can you set up a crowdfunding uh, um, project? It's an interesting question. I asked the, the so knowledge so transfer yeah. people at CERN. Mm -hmm. and they went, what? No, 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 no. <laughs> it, they know perfectly about it, but okay. it's delicate. It's mm -hmm. delicate because. Um, some people might not understand that such a big player CERN goes to a crowdfunding site like um, Kickstarter or something like that. So there are some experiences already of big players going mm -hmm. to Kickstarter for something and being bashed mm -hmm. about. That's like the, I would have thought thousands of people who work at CERN at this moment. No? Yeah, so, so people would not really understand, because this is a marginal kind of activity at CERN. You, know, you don't have the full power of CERN behind this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if, if, if you had, then you would have a very good tool in, in no time. But um, mm -hmm. The, um, <laughs> I would have thought that everybody that understood anything at all about the academic grant system would understand why CERN would go to Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, the thing is, it's delicate. It's, uh, you know, there have been some examples of, of uh, big corporations or big institutes or institutions going to Kickstarter and then somebody saying, what are you doing here? This is for, you know... Um, well, it looks bad. Uh, it looks like... No, you're, but you're going to it, Internally, you're too incompetent to fund projects that are interesting, so you have to go to Kickstarter? Yes. That looks bad. Yeah, um, but yes, so is that, that will be... Yeah, no, you know, and, and then you will have to start explaining that CERN's goal is really to study physics, mm -hmm. and that uh, there is this other uh, way of doing things now in, in knowledge transfer. They have these activities which are not in the core mission of CERN, which, but which still, still present an interest to society, mm -hmm. and you are allowed to work on that. But this is really not the core, um, mm -hmm. core business of CERN. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a small team at CERN working on something which is interesting to society, but definitely not core business. Okay. Right? Um, and, and CERN does raise funds. They have a fundraising, an incipient, and it's, it's just starting now, uh, fundraising uh, group. Uh, which will try to get funds for these kind of activities because they cannot come from the standard CERN budget. The standard CERN budget is to build accelerators and to study physics. Higgs boson has been found. Um, what, are you gonna, what are you guys going to do for an encore? For an oh, go afterwards. Yeah. Um, study the Higgs boson. I, yeah. I, you know, if, if only we could know. No, this, by definition, you don't know what's coming, right? It's just basic research. It's very tough, um, it's very tough to convince funding agencies to give you money when you, don't, we, when you cannot tell them what you will find. You've got a theoretical basis for guessing what's the next particle to be found or something like that. Yes. And what, what range of energy is you going to need to do it. And I think the next, the next accelerator you guys are going to have to build is about the size of the solar system, no? Hmm. No, 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 no. It, it depends. It's it depends on who, what, what physicists you ask, really. But it's um, the most exci exciting stuff happens when actually you find something that you did not expect. And um, you cannot say, I have to look here. You have to look through the whole energy range and hoping that you find something which you didn't expect, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But again, in terms of PR, it's really hard to uh, convey the excitement. Uh, sometimes, for example, you, you uh, scan a frequent, um, an energy region and you don't find anything. Yeah. And that's actually very exciting sometimes because you know, there are lo all sorts of theories that have been dispelled because of these non-finding. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very difficult to convey, to convey the excitement because uh, always the appearance of something is more exciting than the non-appearance. Mm -hmm. So um, 
certainly I think they're doing a better job these days of communicating the results of science. A really good job in my opinion. Uh, because it's really hard to, to explain why these things are relevant and why you don't always find stuff every month and so on. I mean yeah, yeah, I, I, I understand that. I, mean, I used to work in, in particle physics myself a little bit. That was a long time. That was 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, the project I was working on fell through because you couldn't explain what the point was to the Canadian uh, to the Canadian people. Mm -hmm. The government was perfectly happy to pay for the thing, yes. not for the maintenance, not for the electricity you build, but for for building the thing. It's great for politicians to have your photograph taken in front of mm -hmm. particles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a, the superconducting supercollider story in the U.S. Oh as well. yeah, yeah. That so also I fell through. That. Also fell through. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, do we just, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, we can do this discussion maybe later? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have another well, hardware now. Hardware. Yes. Yeah. Can I have another more related question uh, coming to the FPGA design tools? Um, do you have any suggestion um, in terms of design language? Is there a clear trend towards VHDL regarding open project or Verilog? Uh, some suggestions for a yeah. guide? I might, okay, I will say my opinion. Uh, no. Uh, the, I don't. I don't think it's too important to use VHDL or Verilog. I think these are the two dominating languages right now, and they have been for a long time. Uh, some people like to use newer stuff like System Verilog. I, I don't see a big trend of transition between. So far as the design itself is concerned, maybe test benches are another story. Uh, but what's important is to become a good digital designer, and then I, I always say that these are description languages. Uh, so the D in VHDL is description. Uh, so it will allow you to describe a, a design that you already have in your mind. And if you're a good designer, it will be very, uh, not very relevant if you express it in VHDL or in very low, in my opinion. Okay. And there's no clear winner market-wise. Uh, as I say, FPGA, some people say FPGA people use more VHDL and ASIC people use more very low. Some people say that uh, yeah, Europeans use more VHDL and, and Americans use more Verilog. So, can you uh, see a trend on the stuff published on Open Course or on on your website? No, no. no. Okay. I think they are both both strong. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you are looking for a purely open source uh, tool set, well, except for the synthesis tool, Verilog is slightly yes because of Icarus. Icarus very Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more question about the license. Um, how is it about uh, the other? Uh, I heard or uh, understood that there are also other uh, open hardware licenses now yes. nowadays. Yes. Um, which one was the first, or how do they relate? So, or is there, can you uh, maybe short of it? Uh, there's two main hardware licenses, which are in fact becoming, as, as, as they both evolve, they are becoming more and more similar, actually. Okay. So there might be a point in, in merging at some point. Okay. One is Tapper, the Tucson, Arizona Packet Radio Association. Uh, that was the first serious hardware license, and uh, it's a persistent license. Uh, in the sense that if you modify, you should release on the same terms of the license. Similar to the CERN one. Yes, yes, yes. CERN started, started out as a quite different to Tapper and it's becoming, uh, with version 1.2, becoming more similar. Tapper has plans to evolve into another version which is, will make it even more similar to CERN. Uh, so, um, yes, and these are the two licenses which are specifically for, for hardware, and they are copyleft style in a way, so persistent. Mm -hmm. um, specifically for hardware, as opposed to Creative Commons, for example, where, which you can also use to um, cover schematics and PCB layouts. In that Creative Commons setting, you don't really consider the fact, or you're not concerned by the fact that these documents will at some point become hardware, or be the basis uh, mm -hmm. of a hardware production. Mm -hmm. right? It says, you just protect the documents as such. Ah, okay. mm -hmm. these, these, these other licenses, Tapper and CERN, they take that into account. So they try to make an effort, for example, CERN makes a big effort to make sure that when somebody builds a product and ships it to a customer, that this final client has access to the design files, for example. Mm -hmm. That you cannot do with a Creative Commons license. The Creative Commons doesn't say anything about what will happen when you manufacture mm -hmm. electronics. Now, whether you achieve it or not with a CERN license is still subject to discussion because, of course, this is a very new uh, thing and, and uh, to which extent copyright applies, to which extent contract law is applicable. All these things are not 
uh, definitively settled until um, a judge in a court uh, gets to inspect them. And you know, in 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 common law countries, uh, I think it's common law, like in the U.S. Uh, and you know, countries where the law is built upon cases and actual experience, right? And then you can refer to a case in the past and say. Has there any been it, has there been any violations up until now? Uh, not not that we're aware of. Okay. What has happened already, which is very good, is people taking seriously the license. That means not challenging it. That we have examples of people who modified our stuff and released the modification under the Cernovichel license. So one of our boards um, had a, an FPGA, but not, micro, not a microprocessor. Somebody made a, a, added a, a microprocessor on the board, released the result. Uh, in another board, they made it. They made the FPGA version evolve a bit. Uh, all these things were released. So we get smaller feedback already in this. Uh, yes, yes. We didn't modified. use those modified versions, but they no, used okay. no, but uh, it's not necessary. Yes. As far as feedback, design feedback is concerned, we got a lot of that, mm, okay. irrespectively of the persistent nature of the license. Mm. Because, for example, some companies at some point are going to want to build your hardware and sell it, not to you, but to somebody else. And they would take it very seriously, the quality of the design, because they are going to be accountable mm -hmm. for that. So they look at it very, very closely, and they uh, find bugs. And, and to tell you uh, to fix Of course, of course. Yes. Are they fixed them themselves, or uh, how is it done? Both, yeah, both. They, both. They, some, some they fix themselves, some they just inform. Okay. But we have had that, yes. OK, so we get yeah, results and feedback. Yes, yes, it's okay. very useful. And uh, also, the, so either the White Rabbit, for example, um, if there is a company which decides to produce it, um, then actually they shouldn't be allowed to uh, make it proprietary in any way. They um, yes. have to stick to, uh, to the same principle. Yes, if, okay. if we have written the license well, mm -hmm. that should not then happen. Should be, yes. There shouldn't be a loophole. Yes. Okay. How about subsets of the design? So you see a part of a design you think would be really useful in one of your projects. Can you do that and use the same license? Um, yes, so in the license, the wording is that the documentation is covered by the license, and document documentation is anything that you made available under that license, mm -hmm. and which is the basis to uh, make products. And products are derived from the documentation or a subset of the documentation. Okay. So, yeah, you can cover uh, every single subpart of the documentation is, is covered. Yeah. So it's very difficult to set up these kind of uh, law. It's, it has to be tied in the uh, in the law sense. Huh? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I invite you to read it. It's probably clearer than what I say <laughs> because we made a special effort to make it clear. So. But there was a uh, some law person or uh, some. Uh, yes, yes. Oh, we, we, you know, there are there are lawyers. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> the actual writing was done by a lawyer. Yes. <laughs> question. Question on keypad. Um, what's your strategy for libraries? It's very good person. Very good person. I don't have one. Uh, I, I don't know if you have one. Neither um, do we. Basically, it's hard to fulfill everybody's requirements regarding libraries. There are people who are very concerned about the professional quality of their footprints. All the assembly, courtyard information, uh, thermal stuff that are, on the other hand, completely unnecessary if somebody decides amateur level boards, mm -hmm. which are uh, uh, done using thermal transfer methods. So it's hard to come up with a gold-plated solution for, for, for the libraries, something that will be usable for everybody everywhere. What I would like <coughs> is that the project, the KiCad project itself, as it devotes people to developing parts of KiCad, it, it also de devotes people to actually uh, Keeping a, maintaining a library and being, I will not say help, I, I will not say held accountable for the quality, but at least that they look at it a bit and they say this is fine by our standards. That you would can't, be nice. You, you can't use the reverse engineering laws to import Eagle. Yes, libraries, that so. has been just done. Uh, no, you don't need to reverse engineer anything. Eagle now just, speaks XML, so yeah, so you can. <laughs> that was done because that, that that would answer a lot of the questions. Because yes, yes. Uh, in fact, as as you know, when, when I design PCBs. A huge amount of time is spent creating components that you don't so have. Now we can use the ones from Eagle. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I haven't tested okay. it yet. Well, <laughs> yes. there's okay. a, the okay. guy officially it may not be a strategy, but practically that's a good strategy. Yes, yes. In fact, the, one of the three main developers, there are three main developers in Kika. One of the three main developers developed 
this plugin that mm -hmm. allows you to take um, footprints and the symbols from Eagle yeah. and use them. And he also announced by the same in the same message that this works according yeah. to him and that he will from now on use Eagle symbols mm -hmm. and, and footprints. So I, I, I certainly was very taken when I realized that the Funnel catalog say had Eagle libraries for every single component. Oh, that's cool. Is that the, who, who, who had the libraries? Fun, fun, you know the fun Farnel, yes. Farnel. 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 Element 14, yeah. which is... Yeah, element 14 for, for, which is, for us uh, claims. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the same developer, also in terms of sharing, which is, I think, a cool idea, um, developed a GitHub plugin. for you. So in the library <coughs> table, you can add a line pointing to a GitHub repo, mm -hmm. and then every single... Um, Footprint and, and symbol in that repo. Not for symbols yet, just for footprints. Footprints, okay. Yep. So every single footprint in that repo will be available to you. So it's very easy to share symbols. You just push them to the GitHub repo and uh, everybody give a pointer to the rest of the world and everybody can use them. That's a cool, cool feature. I like that. Yeah. Okay, um, since we already are at Kikad, um, yeah, are there any questions um, for the open hardware left? or? Otherwise, uh, we can yeah, maybe. Well, okay. The, the only real question that comes from a hackerspace is: Can we use any of the things in the open hardware library to build a doomsday device to take over the world? <laughs> I already asked that question. We, we we can't, can't, no, you did not explicitly. You're not only allowed. You're, you're, you're and, and, and it's not forbidden by the li by the license. No, no. <laughs> it will not be free. And, and um, we passed. I think we passed the, the freedom test. So it will not be free if we. Um, told you what to do with it, right? So, <laughs> but there used to be a restriction on military uses, and taking over the world might fall into that category. So, <laughs> remember, if you're gonna take over the world, do it peacefully. No, 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 no. We do it with a Creative Commons license. Yeah. <laughs> Is that serious though? Did you guys have a military restriction? No, there, no. there was a claim no, no. in the initial version. No, no, there was no. Or in the trial? No, no, that, that did you not sure? even make it. There was ah, some okay. discussion. There was some discussion because so no, CERN, no. Okay. Because okay. CERN was um, created in the 50s yeah. with many physicists coming from many countries, including Russia, the US, and so on. So it was not the time where you, you know, if you, CERN stands for, Centre, yeah. you know, there's nuclear in it. So, um, so if you have, um, it's, it was not deemed to be a good mix to have military and nuclear in the same. So there was in the, in the founding documents of CERN, there is ex it's explicitly said that CERN cannot collaborate with the military ever. Um, and that's a question that we asked ourselves when we were drafting the license. Should we have uh, a, a clause saying that this shall not be used for military purposes? And then, if we had had that clause, it would not be a free license, as in freedom. Yeah. And, and so, so if try, was, right, try to try to enforce a, a, a clause like that. Also, you're not going to get. Yes, I, 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 I guess the real question is just how steerable is that particle be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, the license itself is some kind of political statement, I would say, or a political thing. And then, such a clause would make sense for me. Yes, no, but in no, fact, what, no we are, what we are asked not to do is collaborate. You know, we just put a document out. Mm -hmm. And um, as any other stuff that the CERN puts out can be used by anybody to, already. Mm -hmm. So the license is just one more document out there. Yeah, sure. So uh, it would be, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it would be very useful. And in fact, then it would really not qualify as a free license and it would be less used, which is something that, you know, we would like this license to be used. Mm -hmm. And some people care, even if they are not military themselves, they really want that the license is free. Mm -hmm. I guess history shows that if the military wants it, they, they don't yeah. really want exactly. it. <laughs> 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 yes, exactly. Yes, and they will not tell you about it. Yeah. <laughs> and this, this, this website you showed, um, does it only host the open hardware project from CERN or also from outside? Mm -hmm. Come on. Uh, yeah, this, this you can go back. It's like this. Um, uh, yeah, there's quite an, an amount of projects from outside. Of this. Um, I don't remember the numbers. Like it's like 50 outside. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's I think yeah, like there's a bit less than half from outside. Open the uh, thing. Web page. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And one 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 last question. I remember discussing with somebody from CERN how useful a red hard Arduino would be. Did you ever get one created? 
There is one thing at CERN which the experiments use in the thousands. What's the name of this? GPT? E ELMB. Ah, ELMB, okay. The ELMB board, which is a bit like an Arduino, uh, which is right hard. Um, it's, uh, it's a little microcontroller with lots of interfaces, and it's a little board, and it's replicated by the thousands in, uh, in Atlas. Is, is that in the license head? Um, it, that was designed before uh -huh. we came up with the license, but the evolution of it, the, the ELMB++, mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. it's called, is there's a project in the OHR. I don't know what they're up to. I don't know if they have already uploaded schematics and so on, but um, it's there. It's a project in the OHR. Yes. There you go, Eric. Something for you, Pierre. <laughs> Here's not radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you said last week. <laughs> well, it doesn't quite show half that thing. <laughs> <laughs>